My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And I would like to take this opportunity to uh, welcome you to the evening services of our church for Sunday, October the 23rd. Per usual, we'll be singing several songs, observing the Lord's Supper, and then I have a message that I hope will be useful to you. Pardon the singing today. My singing partner, my wife, uh, is visiting her siblings in Kansas. Please pray for her safe return as she comes back tomorrow. I will do my best with the songs. If you would please turn to number 435. We are singing, we are singing from our songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. The name of this song is Come into His Presence. And so if you do not have, uh, Songs of Faith and Praise, but uh, you can Google the song or you have another book. Uh, the title of the song is Come Into His Presence, number 435. <clears throat> Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voices raise, your voices raise. Give glory and honor and power unto him. Jesus, the name above all names. Jesus, the name above all names. If you would, number 722. 722. The title of this song is Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in Me. Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen, number seven. 22. <clears throat> Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wonderful passion and purity. May his spirit divine all my being refine. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some word spoken that pierces you through and through, Think how he was beguiled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning till close of day, in example, in deeds, and in all you say, Lay your gifts at his feet, ever strive to keep sweet. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. The song before the Lord's Supper is number 366 by Christ Redeemed. 366 by Christ Redeemed. Redeemed. <clears throat> By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come his body given in our stand is seen in this memorial brand and as we drink we see the blood until he come and the 
Dost that dark betray all night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he come. As we are instructed on the first day of the week, uh, we are to uh, gather about the Lord's table in communion. I will touch on that a little bit during the lesson this evening. Um, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, very, very, very specifically says, and they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. We do this uh, in remembrance of Jesus Christ, of our great high priest, of our great savior, as the great son of God, who came to the earth in form of a man. He experienced everything that a man can experience. He had a physical body. Uh, he felt pain. Uh, he felt anguish. He could be tempted. Uh, yet, uh, uh, it was God's plan that his son would die a death here on earth. And that death would be died for the sins of mankind. And so as we gather about the table, we uh, look at it as a memorial. It is a, moral, a memorial of his death and his burial. And as we uh, partake of the bread, we think of his body, which suffered as nails were driven in his hands and in his feet, and a sword pierced his side. Uh, let's pray for the bread. When we partake of this bread, dear Heavenly Father, we think of Jesus' body, racked in pain, feeling the anguish of nails driven in hands and feet, giving his life up as a propitiation for our sins. Help us to remember that pain. Help us to remember that agony. Help us to remember what Jesus was willing uh, to give up, that we might live, that we might see you one day. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. We know that the blood is uh, the life-giving fluid that runs through the body of humans. It runs through the body to carry everything to each part of the body that it needs. When the blood cannot do that, uh, we cannot function and we cannot live. As Jesus was hung on the cross, blood flowed from his hands and his feet and from his side. Uh, that blood uh, is explained to us as being that blood that washes away our sins, that life-giving blood. And so we look at it that way as we gather about the table. The fruit of the vine represents the life-giving blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, your plan was so wonderful and so magnificent that Jesus at exactly the right time came to us as sinners. He gave himself up. He shed his innocent blood that we might live. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember that life-giving blood. Help us remember and understand what it means to me that our sins are washed away. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And also on the first day of the week, we are instructed to lay by in store and give back to the Lord that which we have prospered. Uh, it's uh, amazing how we have been prospered. And it is amazing to know that we came into this world with nothing. We will leave this world when we die with nothing. But we are instructed to give back to the Lord. Uh, we give back to the Lord in the form of money money used by the church, Jesus's body, uh, and given back so that the church can utilize this to spread the word, to give uh, 
um, to give opportunity to those that need to hear the life-saving gospel. Also, these monies can be used to, in benevolence of those that have need. Uh, let's pray for the giving. We're so grateful to Heavenly Father that not only we had the ability to give, but we had the desire to give understanding that it is instruction from the New Testament that we do lay by in store. We do understand that the scriptures tell us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Help us to give with cheer. Help us to give with a, with a heart that's uh, filled with compassion and love so that the monies will be used to spread your word, to help those in need. Be with us as we give. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And the song before the lesson is number 172. I just came to praise the Lord. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. <clears throat> I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to love the Lord. I hope you were able to participate in the singing. I know that the Lord was praised, and I know that our hearts were lifted as we sang praise to him. If you were there this morning, uh, you heard that the title of the lesson this evening is to be making life meaningful. Making life meaningful. How often have you heard uh, people say, um, I don't know what meaning there is in my life. Uh, I feel like I lack meaning, that I lack purpose. Perhaps um, we've asked the question, how can God use me? Um, let's look at some of the practical ways that the, the scriptures explain to us about making life meaningful. It's a, it's a thought provoking question, isn't it? And one that literally I think all of us really need to ask. The most miserable people I have found on, on the earth of those are those that don't have a clear purpose in life or whose purpose is totally focused on self key to my lesson this evening is this. Life is meaningful only when it is focused on God and others. Now, when Jesus was asked what was the greatest of all commandments in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 77, uh, 37, that's Matthew 22, 37, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. That's our first commandment. That's our first purpose in life. Our first purpose is to love our God with every fiber of ourselves. Notice the wording. With all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind that encompasses everything that we have. But see, not far behind that, Jesus gave the second commandment in verse 39, when he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so our purpose in life is to serve God 
and to serve others. This is pretty important stuff. I'm hoping you know this already. Sometimes we need to be refreshed. Peter, I think, gave a good summary of our purpose in life when in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, he wrote these words. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. Now here, here it is. It says, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. That is First Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Now in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul summed it up this way. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Our purpose in life, according to the Holy Spirit inspired Apostle Paul, is to die to self and let Christ shine through us. It's a great challenge, isn't it? No one said Christianity was going to be easy. There are challenges in our life of being a Christian. The greatest purpose one can have on earth is to let Christ shine through us. Now, with that in mind, we're talking about purpose. How does one accomplish that purpose? Another uh Another provocative question. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So our first purpose in life is our love for God. One of those commandments that's given to us is to meet and assemble on the first day of the week. A few moments ago, we gathered around the Lord's table to eat some unleavened bread and to drink some of the fruit of the vine. And in Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, Jesus very succinctly said, Do this in remembrance of me. And so as we eat the bread, we remember how he physically suffered, how his body was racked uh, in pain. As we drink of the fruit of the vine, we are reminded of the blood that he shed so that we can have our sins forgiven. Not only does assembling with other Christians enable us to show our love for God, but it also help us to stay focused on our purpose in life. As we live our daily lives, it's easy to let the physical part of, li of life become our focus when our real purpose is supposed to be spiritual. And we need to keep in mind to separate between the, the between the urgent and the important. Now, things pop up into our life as we make decision after decision, day by day. 
but we are to separate the urgent from the important. There, there are many ways that humans can show their love for God, but particularly as we live our daily lives and we must do it in a world that is not a perfect world. When we gather together with the saints on the first day of the week, it will keep us focused on our purpose. When I get up to speak on Sunday morning, it is with purpose. And I look out there and I see eyes looking at me. I see people that are attentive. We have purpose. We sing songs of praises to the Lord. We do that with purpose, telling the Lord how much we love him. We love him enough that we lift our voices in praise to him. We give back to the Lord of our physical means in that we show that the Lord's church, the church that Jesus died for, Jesus' church means something to us. It has real meaning. There's teeth to that. And so we give back so the church can accomplish its purpose. When the church accomplishes its purpose, it is accomplishing the purpose of each individual within the church. And so as we gather together, all of these purposes melt together and we can achieve the purpose that God has set before us. Another part of our purpose is to put others before self. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Paul put it this way, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another more important than yourselves. Did Jesus reflect this in his life? Surely he did. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said to his disciples, therefore he said to us, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so as Christians, we ought to have a willingness and a readiness to serve those in the church and sometimes extend that out to serving those in the world. How can we hope to bring people in the world into the fold of Jesus Christ if we don't serve them? You know, it's, it's like going in foreign mission field to people who are hungry. Uh, before we can feed them the gospel message, we need to feed their bodies. We need to make them feel uh, worthwhile in what we physically give to them. And in that, when people know that we are messengers of God with a purpose, with a purpose of service, then they will listen to that gospel message because they will understand that this is there is purpose in this. There is purpose in serving others. Now, you know what? I am convinced that in life there are that people fall into two categories. They fall into the categories of givers and takers. I would huh, chastise you. I would suggest to you that you be in the giver category. Because what happens is, is the takers are willing to take, but they're not willing to serve. Givers are willing to give in that giving. They are servants of God. This is a life of purpose. Another part of our purpose 
is to find our place of service in the church. Now, you might ask, well, what is my purpose? Well, again, the Apostle Paul puts it together in such a way that I think all of us can understand it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, it says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body. It is not for this reason any less part of the body. And so as we look at the parts of the body, we may deem some uh, more important than others, but each has a place. Without our feet, we can't walk. Without our hands, what can't we do? Without our ears, without our eyes, without our nose, without our taste buds. All of the parts of our body have function to them. Now, Paul went on to not just mention hands and feet, but he mentioned several parts of the body, uh, the physical body. The, port, the point is that all parts, if the body is, is supposed to work as part of the expression, a well-oiled machine, all those parts need to work together. We know what happens when one part doesn't work. If something happens to our leg, we have trouble walking. All right. If something happens to our ears or our eyes, we have trouble hearing or we have trouble seeing. The point is that for the body to work, all the parts have to function the way they're supposed to function. And the same is true spiritually, because this isn't a physical lesson. This is a spiritual lesson. All parts of the spiritual body are supposed to function together. And each is as important as any other member. Don't, don't compare yourself with another member. I do more than he does. I do more than she does. All are needed. Paul made an interesting statement in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, verse 18, where he says, but now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. What does God know that sometimes we fail to recognize? He understands that you and I have a place in his kingdom here on earth. We have a purpose. We have an ability. All of us has some ability that God has given to us. In the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30, we, you know, we look at the man was given 10 talents and the man was given five talents. But we, we always look down our nose at the man who was given one talent. But understand, even the one talent man was given something. And we are given something. And with that, God has expectations of us to use that which he has given us. Whatever is your God-given talent, you are to use it so his kingdom on earth, the church, can function the way it's supposed to function. Now, you may not feel careful being a teacher in front of a class, or you might not even be uh, a person who is very comfortable with talking to strangers. But there is something God has given you that the church needs. You just need to, to uh, find that out and you have to work at it. You, you may be especially good at something that no one else in the church is good at. If that's the case, use that for the betterment of God's kingdom here on earth. Sometimes, we may need to get out of our comfort zones and try something that we have not done before. And lo and behold, you may find out that this thing 
might become a strength for you. Your, your talent may be uh, encouraging those and reaching out to those. Even though uh, you may not be able to teach them, you may be able to encourage them, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 24. Encourage those. Your, your talent may be that you have funds that you can give back to the church. And furnishing those funds, you may help the church to function. Your talent may be to be a great Bible student and help others to grow in their knowledge of the Lord. Because when you become a good student and you learn, then you have your opportunity to share the word with others. You know, we all have a talent. And, and bless us, some of us are multi-talented. Here's what the bottom line, I think, to this lesson is. And if we go back to the title, the title was Making Life More Meaningful. When we take the talents that God has given to us, you and I will both find our lives to be more meaningful. They will be purpose driven spiritual lives that God wants us to live godly lives for him using the talents that he's given to us for the betterment of his kingdom here on earth. You know, we need to be part of that kingdom. We need to be part of that kingdom by the faith and the belief that we have in our God the faith and belief that we have that Jesus Christ and his, is his son. And so part of that is obedience to God's plan. If we are to live with him forever, we need to follow his plan of salvation. We need to believe in the word of God. We need to confess that Jesus is the son of God. We need to repent of those things that we've done and be sorry for them and tell the Lord we don't want to do those again. And we must be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. If you are one of those people, the invitation is open to you. If you need that, we are at your call. You have but to get in touch with one of us and we will help you in any way that we can. Let's pray as we close this service. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, your plan was so wonderful, that uh, in your plan that you sent Jesus to us, in your plan, he was the master teacher that taught us how to live our lives, who turned the world literally upside down with his teachings. Help us to follow that master teacher and help us to understand that he came to this earth knowing that he would die and they would take that into our hearts also. Help us to understand that the greatest command that we have is to love our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul and all of our mind and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Bless us in this life. Help us to utilize the talents that you've given us so the kingdom of God here on earth will increase. Continue to bless us. Continue to comfort us and help us to bless, comfort, and encourage others in our life. May we be what you want us to be in this life. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Please, all of you be safe, and may God bless you all.